Welcome to Three Wise Women with Catherine Wiley, entrepreneur, charity campaigner, and founder of the Catholic Grandparents Association, the fastest growing lay movement in the Catholic Church. Dana, international singer, composer, and broadcaster, twice presidential candidate for Ireland, and former member of the European Parliament. Kathy Sinnott, disability rights campaigner, former member of the European Parliament and syndicated host for EWTN Global Catholic Radio. Coming from Crowpatrick, Ireland, Walsingham, England and Delray Beach, Florida, these are the Three Wise Women. Hello and welcome to the Three Wise Women. I'm Dana. I'm Catherine Wiley. And I'm Kathy Sinnott. You know, on EWTN, we pay special attention to the life issue because we're talking about protecting our most vulnerable brothers and sisters from the moment their life begins until its natural end. Our Lord said, whatever you did to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did to me. Well, today we're going to look at protection of life from the perspective of Great Britain. We're going to see what's happening there. And to help us with this, I want to welcome Claire McCullough of the Good Council Network. Claire, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for being with us. You know, earlier you were telling us about the incredible work of the Good Council Network. But before we get into that, would you give us an overview of what's happening with the crisis for life in the United Kingdom today? Well, abortion was legalised in the UK in 1967 and uh, since then the abortion figures have risen every year up until about three or four years ago. So we have an average abortion figure of about 200,000 abortions every year. Wow. In the last couple of years we've seen a slight drop in the figures, so now for the whole of the UK, or England and Wales at least, uh, it's 185,000 every year but it's still a huge crisis. And it's important to say that we don't have legalised abortion in Northern Ireland. Yes, which mm -hmm. is a great blessing. Um, so in England and Wales, the, we have these huge numbers. On top of that, we have easy availability of the morning after pill. And there's constant efforts to increase the availability of abortion. Abortion is free here for most people. And we already do have abortion up to six months for virtually any reason. And then from six months up to birth, it's available in the case of handicap or risk to the life of the mother or the health of the mother. So abortion is really a crisis uh, situation in the UK. The and, and I believe that um, morning after pills are available to girls of any age from uh, national chains of That's right, yes. Pharmacies. And, and they even post them out in packs of 10 for women so that they can have them available, uh, especially at Christmas and you know, points in the year where they think that it's going to be a, a special offer to give women easily available morning And that's pills. without a prescription, isn't it? <coughs> yes. Such a, such a dangerous, can't even call it a medication, you know, it's, it's an abortifacient. How long have you been working now with your ministry, Good Counsel? So we've been working for the last 16 years in London doing, doing this outreach. Have there been big changes in that time? Yes, there have been. I think uh, one thing that's happened in England is the government has um, begun to pay for more and more abortions. That's one thing we've seen. There's a lot less private abortion, which means that you're seeing um, more women going through the NHS hospitals, but also the big abortion chains like Mary Stopes and BPAS, which we have in England, are being paid by the NHS to perform most of their abortions. The other thing that has happened is there's a huge uh, emphasis on chemical abortion, so giving women a pill rather than surgery, and kind of trying to give the woman the impression that she's just getting rid of um, cells or blood. The or big lie. Much more so than, yes. than can Which be. gets harder with ultrasound and all those beautiful 3D pictures. Well, it's something that we've been re really blessed with is over the last two years we've been able to offer women ultrasound because in the clinics they do the ultrasound but they don't show the ultrasound to the women. So that's been a real blessing for us, yeah. And um, if the woman doesn't see the picture, obviously she doesn't know what yeah. she's doing. She doesn't know the choice she's making. Really. And do you see a big difference when you show the woman the picture? Oh, we see a huge difference. Her child. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. You know, women come in and you think that 
with all the help you offer them that they, they just can't take the chance on accepting it. But when they see their baby, suddenly whatever they have to experience, whatever they have to go through to keep the baby becomes worth it because they know why they're doing it. You know, um, I think you did share earlier that you, you'd actually thought you would end up being a political lobbyist on the, ice, on the life issue, but you give a beautiful explanation of the practical work that you're involved in and why that was important. Yes, well, I do feel that, you know, if God wants us to witness to this truth about life, we have to be able to show society that we're not just saying, no, don't do this, but we're offering real support to women. And I found over the years that actually the majority of women seeking abortion, which after all is a real choice of despair, you know, want alternatives. If there's good alternatives and real friendship for those women, more women want to choose life than want to choose to end their pregnancy. In your experience, what would be the percent? Like how many women will change their mind when you contact them? Well, most of the women we see are very set on abortion when we first come in contact with them, and about 70% of them will 70. keep their baby when offered help and support. And that's been consistent from the time we started our work up until the present. Okay. Okay. What, what actual methods do you use to help people, to encourage them? Uh, well, first of all, we try and take as much information from the woman about her circumstance. She knows her situation better than we do, and we try never to presume that we, we know what it feels like. You know, I never say to a woman, I know how you feel. I can say, I understand what you're saying, and I'm, I'm sorry for your pain, but I don't try and pretend that I'm in her situation. And so we learn a lot from the woman first. Then we try and show her the development of her baby, what stage her baby would be at. Then we try and talk to her about the different options for abortion and what they would really involve, because often the woman herself doesn't know, you know, she takes two pills, she doesn't know what they do, she doesn't know what's happening to her own body. And then we try and talk to her about her own conscience and her own values. And in fact, you know, most people in their heart know that the taking of life is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the most common... Do they? I mean, of the, of the women that you've counselled... Do, do you have a, a memory of that actually happening? Yes, oh yes, I think the majority of women, you know, the, the big lie is to pretend to the woman that it's not a life yet. Uh, that's why clinics do that, because many women, most women, do have a basic belief that if it's a baby, taking the life is wrong. So the, the focus for the clinics is often on pretending it's not a baby. Yeah. I, I know that you have different facets to the work you do. Tell us about the different facets of the Good Counsel Network. Well, the, the, probably the most important thing that we do is we have the, the backup of help and support for the woman. It's not just talk, but there's real help for her, places to stay, um, financial support. We give out about £40,000 worth of food vouchers every year to women who have nothing, no rights to benefits, no rights to work. Um, and then also we have an outreach outside the abortion clinics very much based on the Helpers of God's Precious Infants approach that was developed That's by Monsignor Philip Riley. Monsignor Riley. Yes. And it's a very peaceful, <clears throat> prayerful, woman-centred approach, but also very truly Christian in its approach, um, where you really go out to offer everything in terms of spiritual prayer and the love that you can give to the woman outside the clinic in a very peaceful way to try and draw her away from abortion and, and make her aware of the deep care that we have for her, not just for her baby, but for her and her baby, and for all the staff involved in abortion as well. Claire, how does she find you? How do, you how, do, how do they know where you are? How do they get to you? Well, every day we have about eight interns at the moment who will go out to the different abortion clinics in London and will pray there and offer leaflets uh, detailing the help and support that we can they give. They pray on the street? They pray on the street. And um, there'll be one counsellor who will approach girls going into the clinic very gently. They stand back from the door. They don't block the woman's way. It's just a very gentle, prayerful approach. And they will offer her the help leaflet and they'll offer her rosaries. They'll offer to pray for her as well. Is that against the law, Claire? I mean, are you allowed to do that? You are allowed to do that. And we always inform the police of what we do. Um, in fact, Mary Stopes recently um, issued us with a legal letter warning us that we are not to give out pink and blue rosary beads outside their clinics and we are not to give out our help leaflet, but in fact, you know, that has no legal basis at all. They have no right to stop us. One thing we find with uh, Mary Stopes clinics in particular is when we give the women the leaflets 
as they go into the clinic, the staff take them off them as they go in the door and say, you're not allowed to have that in here, which actually works in our favour because a certain number of women come out quite offended, saying, can I have another one of those? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have to say, you know, there are probably people watching who have spent hours and hours and hours outside clinics and may never have actually encountered anyone who's turned around and, and come back. But I, I'm sure we all personally know, and I certainly personally know, of women who, because someone was praying outside a clinic, never went into the clinic and have their babies, and uh, they're now grown, um, because of those people who faithfully prayed outside. I'm sure you must experience daily when you're there, turnarounds, and you get to know those women. Oh yes, yes, I mean we see many turnarounds now. We have a daily vigil <coughs> at two different clinics in London, and every day, more or less, the, the girls there will speak to one or two women who will say they're thinking of keeping their baby. Most days we have one or two or three girls come into our centre from those vigils looking for help to keep the baby. But interesting you should say that about people who pray outside the clinics and don't see a turnaround. You know, I think one of the most important things in our work is hope because abortion is all about despair. And one of the things we found fascinating is Monsignor Riley developed this very simple blue leaflet. You know, it just says pregnant, worried, we can help you. It's got a line drawing of a baby on the front. It's not very sophisticated. List the help inside that can be offered. And we find regularly women coming into our centre and they'll pull out a concertina leaflet and they'll say, three years ago when I had my abortion, somebody offered me this leaflet and I, I wasn't able to come for the help that time. I wasn't sure I could trust you, but this time I'm, I'm back and I want oh, to keep my baby. Kept it all that time. It's happened hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times. So the prayers of people who are outside the clinic and never see turnarounds, you know, you never know really. And some of those women who, you know, walk away from you or shout at you angrily even, which very occasionally does happen, uh, will go away and keep the baby and you will never know, but it does happen and you've got to keep that hope and just keep that presence there, even if you don't see the results, because we see hundreds of the results of other hundreds, people's prayers. you do, hundreds you actually do. But are, are there times when they do comment on the prayer, I mean, uh, do the, the prayers, because it, it can be, you know, day after day praying, I mean, do they ever get feedback? Oh yes, indeed, I mean, we, we do, you know, ourselves see many women who have kept the baby, and we always try and find the person who offered them help, and let them know what the outcome has been, that the woman has come and sought help, so... So sometimes they do hear the good news, but can even when they do Can people stay with you, Claire? The, is it residential? You're, can the people stay with, can the girls stay with you? We have two houses that um, mothers can stay in during their pregnancy. And actually we're really looking to find more property. We were trying to, to buy a convent that was up for sale in London recently because we're looking for something with maybe 30 or 40 beds where mothers could stay. But um, we have those two houses. We also have, in previous clients that we've helped over the years, girls that have been pregnant and received help themselves, they will often help us by taking in girls who are homeless, which is a great blessing and great witness. Mm -hmm. So you're dealing, um, from what I'm picking up, you said women who couldn't get uh, support, um, I suppose you mean from the government, they can't get any financial support or housing. Yeah. They're destitute, therefore. Yes, I mean, I have to say, I think financial help isn't the biggest issue with abortion. I think for us, the main reason women consider abortion, well, I'd say, if I had to sum it up in one word, it would be contraception. You know, women take risks in relationships where they know they can't have a child because they think contraception will protect them, and it often lets them down. But for us, as an organisation, a small organisation, we find that at the moment there's a huge demand for practical and financial help. And we are seeing in London, where we have a huge, you know, huge immigration and often people overstaying their visas and becoming illegal, not having papers, we see a huge number of women who can't get help from any other charity and are really considering abortion because they're on the street, mm -hmm. um, because they have no money to feed themselves, because they have other children they can't afford to feed. And, and you know, we have pro-abortion groups protesting about us, uh, our work outside the clinics, who claim to be pro-women, who just don't know these women exist. And when we talk about these women, they deny that these women exist. But there are actually thousands of women in London who have no right to any form of support at all. And therefore all over Britain as well. 
But what I find absolutely horrifying was you said that uh, a woman who was eight months pregnant from another charity was offered a bus ticket because that was all they could give her, not that they were denying her, but it was all they could give her to get her off the street, was to yeah. give her a bus ticket. It's a regular occurrence that women you know, who are heavily pregnant are sleeping on buses because they don't have anywhere else to sleep. And I think it's a very unrecognised problem in, in Britain at the moment because most people with rights will have benefits, they'll have housing, and you know, there's a big push at the moment to, to reduce that support for people. But this issue of people with no recourse to public funds is kind of an unseen problem. Unless you're working in the charity sector, you're not really aware it exists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Claire, Claire, if girls are staying with you, do you provide for them and do you, do you provide clothes for the baby and all the things that the baby needs? Yes, yes. I mean, the woman will receive housing, she'll receive money and vouchers for food and travel while she's staying with us. She'll get support in caring for her baby and learning to, to care for the baby after it's born. She'll receive the baby goods that she needs, and that's ongoing, really. There's no point where we say, oh, well, your child's too, now go away. I mean, you know, whatever age the child is, if she's still in financial difficulties or if she still needs our moral support, we're, we're there for her. In fact, at one of our vigils recently, we had a mother turn up with her daughter, who's 14, to say that, actually, you know, she's a, a child who was born through your work. Isn't that absolutely it's a great wonderful. blessing for it's her. It's absolutely you know, wonderful. I think a lot of times, I mean, in my experience of of talking to women, the critical piece uh, that was pushing them to abortion is all the friends that say, oh, you can't do this, or you won't be able to finish school, or you won't, you know, you've no money, all the negative things. And that what they needed was one person to say, you can do this, and we'll help you. So and that true. that makes the critical thing, because women are amazing at what they can do. And men, too, can be asked to step up to the plate. But when they're only told, you can't do this, you know, it'll all go badly, you know. And so I think work like yours, where you can say, well, we're there to help you. You can do it. Who, who, where do you get support from? How do you manage? Well, I mean, this sounds like a huge enterprise, apart from the human effort that goes in. Where do you get financial support from? At the moment, all our support really comes through just individuals. You know, we have a newsletter we send out to people. We have a blog called Maria Stops Abortion. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> I think that's fantastic. And um, we Maria Stops probably down. really likes that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, through that, we, we try and recruit people who sympathize with our work. So mainly it comes to that. There are some parishes who have a Lenten Arms collection or let us come in and do an appeal. But that's really the sum total of our, our funding. We don't get any government funding. or. So do social services help you or hinder you? Well, I think for, for those girls who have the most practical needs, the ones who don't have recourse to public funds, social services can come and assess them and sometimes make more problems for them really because they can see all the papers they don't have and all the things they don't have for their children. But they can't offer them anything. And in fact, we often get social services referring girls to us to house mm -hmm. them because they can't house them. So you definitely are in need of continued financial support and you, if there's a spare convent uh, about... I think you probably only are able to give beds to maybe 20, maybe 30 girls. And, That's right. and obviously you have a huge, huge need to, and you know that anyone who can help with that would be grateful. But I, I know for sure that when you're working to protect life, you come out under all kinds of attack. And I, I would like you to share a little bit about that too, you know, how you deal with that. It's a spiritual warfare and you're at the cold face. And how do you deal with that? What supports you in that way? Well, one of the most important things in our work is we have a chapel in our centre. And in the chapel, there's adoration all day. There's mass every day at midday. And this has been such a blessing to us because we know when we're seeing a girl, there's somebody before Jesus in the Eucharist interceding for that girl and for her decision. And certainly, you know, the number of women choosing life is a reflection of that prayer. And even the, the number of girls we're seeing now, which is overwhelming, I mean, we just, we really struggle to cope with the huge number of clients that we see, uh, is an answer to prayer for many years of, that we would see as many girls as we could possibly see. Mm -hmm. 
but there is a lot of attacks on the work. I mean, per personally, you come under a lot of attack. I think if there's any weakness in your life, Satan will exploit it in every possible way. Mm -hmm. If there's any weaknesses in your family, you know, we all have weaknesses. We're all open to attacks more in some areas than others. I think Satan really exploits that too. Um, sometimes with individual girls you're seeing, you'll become aware of very personal attacks on their own life that Satan makes upon them. And it can come in all kinds of forms, as you were saying about the friends around a woman. You know, the number of women I've seen who've been raped, who themselves want to keep their baby but are choosing abortion because other people don't believe it was rape unless they're willing to have an abortion, even the police sometimes. You know, it just shows how Satan can use other people to try and influence the woman in the ways where she's most vulnerable, really. Claire, what makes girls turn around? What's been your experience well, of that? I think at the clinics, when there are people offering help there, when, we, when the girls come in to our centre for that help, we always say to them, what was it that made you consider coming in here today instead of going through with your abortion? And the most common answer is, I asked God for a sign. And when I got to the clinic, there was someone standing there with a the rosary beads and they were offering me help. Isn't, so isn't there a huge contradiction in that, though? I asked God for a sign. So their faith allows them to go into a church and to ask God for a sign, and yet they're going to go and have an abortion. What's yeah. happening with the teaching of the church that it's so confused, that it's so... You know, I really feel from doing this work, one thing I've really learned is sometimes when I hear the way women deceive themselves about what they're doing, I think of the many ways in my own life I do that in small ways and accept it more and more. You know, it's a constant challenge to me to look at how much I can, you know, make things seem to be right when I know they're wrong. And obviously the fact that women can do that about abortion, which is such a huge thing, is a, a crisis really in the faith. When you have Christian women who are able to justify abortion, you know, even though in their heart they know the grave offence it is, it is a sign that there is a crisis in teaching. But I think as well, you know, we find with the prayer this is something that can be undone, actually, with, with prayer and witness, you know, especially with the prayer behind it and the Eucharistic adoration. Actually, what you find sometimes is you don't feel you've said anything that was right, but suddenly the woman's conscience becomes alive, and that is ultimately what will change her decision. You know, um, as you were speaking there, I was remembering something you've mentioned, that initially um, you had, uh, from within the, 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 the parish or the diocese, you had a few priests who had come forward, and now you have many, many priests who are coming forward to uh, to be with you. And uh, I think you said earlier, if you don't mind me just quoting you, you said that she asked for a very big sign, and when she got there, the bishop was there. That's right, yes. And that's, that's a pretty that's big sign. Fantastic. I mean, I think this um, <clears throat> crucial state that we're in, uh, this culture of death, as the late Pope John Paul uh, the, the second said, this culture of death, this conflict between life and death, we need all shoulders to the wheel and we need lay people and church together, standing together. And you're, you're a witness to that. So as we, as we wind up our, our time together, and I think we could probably talk for about three or four programs, but how can we help you? In what way can people watching help? Well, there's so many ways. I mean, prayer is the most important thing. Prayer and fasting. Um, I think, obviously, financial help is something we always need. You know, the need is growing all the time. And it's a great witness. You know, we really see girls turning around and influencing other people. I think it does make a huge impact unseen on our society, this work. Um, you were we, talking about a network, a, pa a past network earlier on, which I thought was wonderful, of girls who've come back who want to help you now with your work. Yes, you know. yes, always some of the most difficult girls that we've seen, you know, the ones that were hardest to help themselves, us, the very ones who come back and offer housing and things to other women. But, you know, we've said one of the things we're really looking for is premises to house more women. That's really key. And we have an intern program where young people can come, anyone can come actually, <laughs> any age, and spend two or three months with us or even longer um, learning about the pro-life work we do. We really want to spread the frontline work we do. We're involved in the 40 Days for Life campaign. In fact, we've just seen one of the clinics involved in one of those early campaigns in England close, which oh, is a great blessing. 
Wonderful. And um, the interns come in and they do frontline work every day and we want them to take that back to their own cities and towns and start centres and start vigils and you know we're really starting to see things turn around in small ways in London and we really want that work to spread. You know Claire, um, you know John Paul the Great, our, our Pope, said that all great evils come to an end and he talked about communism and, and things throughout history. Do you see it coming to an end? Do you see it coming to an end any time soon? How do you see it coming to an end? I do see it coming to an end, and I see it coming to an end soon. I feel like you can almost taste it in the air. Okay, It might not be tomorrow, it might not be next year, but I really feel it's coming. We've seen abortion rising and rising and rising in this country since 1967. And in the last few years, we've begun to see it dip very slightly. But why? You know, it's just begun to happen. There's no logical explanation for it. The clinics are doing everything to make abortion quicker, cheaper, easier. You know, everything about it should say that abortion should be skyrocketing. I mentioned this clinic that's closed in London recently. It's right in the centre of London. You know, suddenly, without a word, they've stopped doing abortions. I really do feel that something is happening. And to me, it's a completely spiritual change. The 40 Days for Life campaigns that we've been involved in, something that's happening all over the world now, and they're starting to see numerous clinics close. I think it will happen, and I think it will happen in a very spiritual way, that by the time it's finished, people will know that it's God himself who has ended this evil. Wonderful. Well, we really have to pray for that. Really? Yes, absolutely. Because I think it's at the point when we, real, when we realize that only God can do this. Exactly. We have to do our efforts that they're not going to change it, that only God can change it. I think that's, and that's what Pope John Paul said, you know, it's, it's at the moment when you come to full dependence that God can then bring an end. Absolutely. Just remembering the words of the man who was such an inspiration in his, in his mission, um, Monsignor Philip Riley, who said that if a woman walks in there and is going to abort her child, the last look she should see in our eyes is love. And when she walks back out of that clinic, the first look they should see is love. And you are just completely underguarded with love in your work. So thank you for that. We're thank so you grateful so you were here today. And thank you for being with us. And please join us again for another program of The Three Wise Women. Thank you.